and we are going to go to the panel. A round table discussion. So we'll give them a nice round of applause uh, once we've uh, brought them up here. So first, there's Adrian Arsenault. Ms. Arsenault is a correspondent for The National, based in Toronto. Over the years, she's been based in London, Jerusalem, and Washington. She has won and been nominated for several, uh, several Gemini Awards, was named the Commonwealth Broadcasting Association's Journalist of the Year in 2005, picked up a Gracie Award for Outstanding Female Correspondent and a Monte Carlo Festival Award for coverage of the Zimbabwe election. Bienvenue. Adrian. <laughs> David Cochran, provincial affairs reporter for CBC Newfoundland and Labrador and the host of On Point, CBC's uh, weekly political talk show. Uh, he's a local guy, born here in St. <laughs> John's. He's earned a bachelor's degree from Memorial University of Newfoundland. He's worked for the CBC since 1998. Thanks for having us, David. Céline Galipo, Céline Galipo uh, disons, a chef d'antenne de Télé-Journal de Radio Canada, as a co foreign correspondent for CBC and Radio Canada. Um, she has been assigned to London, POSCO, Beijing, Paris, where she's covered the, mo the important events of the last 20 years in Chechnya, Kosovo, Iraq, and Algeria, to name only a few places. Moreover, she, she also has received very many prizes and in 2009, she got the she's been officer of the National Order of Quebec and designated as one of the women the most influential in Canada by Globe and Mail. Uh, welcome to Celine. And last but not least, uh, Tom Harrington, the co-host of Marketplace, CBC Television's award-winning primetime investigative consumer show. A native of St. John's and nine-time Gemini nominee, Tom Harrington was previously the sports correspondent for CBC News, reporting for The National. He's worked in Calgary and in Montreal. Uh, he's also been a member of CBC Sports broadcast crew at several Olympic Games, the Commonwealth Games, the Pan American Games in Winnipeg, and the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for being here. Great to be back. Thank you. Yeah. Between the four of you, we probably got 100 years maybe of uh, CBC experience. <laughs> nice, <laughs> very nice. nice. Oh. <laughs> Between the four of you though. <laughs> One of the things that, uh, that we notice when we meet CBCers anywhere across the country, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of pride for what we do. I think we just enjoy what we're doing, we put everything we've got into it. So for you, what drives you? Just to kick these things off, what drives you? What brings you into work today and makes you do what you do? Um, I'll start because I've actually got the seniority here. I've been at CBC 31 years in my current um, uh, employee, but uh, for people locally who might remember a group called the Sanderlings that I sang in uh, at CBC in St. John's back in the 1960s, I have an association with CBC that goes back almost 50 years. Um, and I've, you know, I've often said it's a bit like a, a family, a really quirky, odd family at times with crazy uncles in the basement and maybe a few in-laws that you might not be uh, happy with, but it's still a family. Um, so no matter where you go in Canada, you feel, you feel connected. And I think that's how you and, and others who watch and listen to our programming feel as well, that no matter where you go in Canada, you feel connected. And so for me, and doing this as long as I have in many different places in the country and, and in many different permutations, that never changes, that sense of commitment and connection to Canada, hearing our own voices, seeing our own faces uh, across, uh, across all platforms now. Boy, has that changed. But, so I think there's, there's that part of it, that, that family. And for me, the, my current role in Marketplace and the show that we do is very much, I think, right down Main Street when it comes to what CBC is all about. It's a show that uh, no other network does, would ever, would ever do, and it's been on the air for 40 years now. And so I think it, 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 in its own way, represents what the best of the CBC is. Merci. No, you have a whole experience, not as much as Tom, but, but if you allow me, I will speak in French, and I'm the only Francophone here. I would say that I began uh, with Radio Canada. I wanted to tell public television because I thought it was there we could the best a journalist possible. And today, again, I think that I'm... I, I, now, now I like the Tele Journal, and also, uh, without fearing, without fearing, for example, any report, what they think about it, or whether it's important. In 2010, it was one of our colleagues who was in Nigeria. Uh, there was um, already uh, 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 there was a famine 
There was 13,000 children dead. There was a million to 300,000 young Africans who were in the process of dying of hunger. And so evidently there's all sorts of other important events which happened in Quebec. It was the Commission of Bassarache and the Ottawa and everything. But we, we've decided collectively as a team that day to open with a reporting as a chronicle also all of that. There was a very famous person there in Quebec who had tweeted on her account and with all about Nigeria. Oh, was it suicidary Nigeria? Was it uh, and that day there? We all looked at each other and saying, okay, it begins badly that. But um, we wanted also, we have decided that it was what we had to do finally to look at Nigeria. And he, finally, she wrote on her blog there were 64% of the people had responded. We, we were interested in seeing that the public uh, television makes choices which are different and which are courageous. And I think that for me, every day, it was a little bit that, it's just this pride of being able to do things, journalism, which can be directly tied to things which, which are not necessary with the society itself, but we do it to inform people. We do it to, to for, so people can feel themselves, they can know what is going on, they have the best, uh, they make the best decisions as much as our citizens. That's my pride every day to be able to work on that, and that's what I do. I would, I would never have, I would never have wanted to do anything else than this. Parcours as a mm -hmm. citizen, you've worked in Canada, you've worked abroad, regions and all that. What's, what's it for you? You know, it's funny. I'm listening to everybody talk, and I, and I know that what we all have in common is that we all have a little bit of a problem with authority. And, and, I, and I think, and okay, for me, <laughs> no, okay. no, okay. so this is awkward. Um, <laughs> but I, I think what makes me proud as a journalist in particular is that no one has ever picked up the phone and said to me, mm -mm, don't do that. You know, go easy on that, or don't go down that road. You know, I'm fiercely proud of that at CBC. I think we'd burn the place down if somebody tried to do that to us. So for me, to know that when I go into work and we have knocked down brawls about stories, and we do, uh, it's about the merit of the story. You know, it, it's not about who are we likely to offend. You know, which sponsor is going to be unhappy with us. We don't care. We really don't care. Don't care if people don't like us who are in charge. With all due respect to them, I don't care. I don't work for them. I work for these people. And so that's, that's what makes me uh, happy to go to work every day. Yeah. David. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and Adrian's right about that. I mean, you are given a lot of independence and, and a lot of leash as a journalist working for the CBC. But you have to, of course, earn the length of that leash yes. by being a, a bit of a grown-up about it. What I like working for the CBC here, being the local guy uh, on this panel, is that the stories we get to do here really matter to the people who live next door, the people you run into at the pub, the people you meet at the gym, the people you see at the restaurant. We are given the opportunity to do significant stories about significant issues in the long narrative history of Newfoundland and Labrador. We get to be on the front row of that. And you know, I always said that being a journalist beats working for a living. Not that the job isn't hard and doesn't have its challenges, but you get to go to work every day, talk to people about what's going on, and then at the end of the day, tell everyone else what you talked about. You know, it's, it's a great way to, to, to see a province like Newfoundland and Labrador. I've been to places on the north coast of Labrador and on the islands off the south coast of Newfoundland that I would probably never get to on my own. Um, but this company, and with this commitment to local news, it gives you those opportunities. You get to be in the front row of significant history, and you talk about never being told to back off. Mm -hmm. There's some difficult times here. You know, it's a small province. Big companies have a lot of sway. Powerful premiers have a lot of sway. <laughs> Powerful premiers get very mad at you and cut you off and scream at you in public. Sure. But the bosses get your back <laughs> as long as you're doing your job right. And I think that's important. And the smaller the market, the stronger, more independent you can be as a journalist. And uh, I think CBC sets the standard here and makes it possible for the other media agencies to do it because mm -hmm. if we're taking the heat by being the lead car, everyone else has a little bit more room. And there's, there's something to be said, too, for, and it sounds corny, but it's, it's kind of a vocation to work for CBC because uh, you find, no matter where you go, everybody kind of believes in it. Everybody who works there, they wouldn't be there really if they didn't believe in it. And the fact is that in, in our industry, there are a lot of jobs that pay better than we do. Uh, but the fact is, people are at CBC because we can do everything you just heard. Because when you go to those other places, there simply isn't the range of opportunities to, to stretch your wings as a, as a journalist, for example, to host programs or write. Um, you don't have the commercial interest pressing down on you. I know on my show, that's a, that's a huge issue at Marketplace, but yet there's a wall between what we do and everything else, and, and it's protected. And, uh, and it shows. I mean, people are enjoying our show more than they ever have. But the idea that 
everybody who works at the CBC believes in public broadcasting, much like the people who watch and listen to it. We have that connection I've talked about. I think that's so significant, and we you really do see that. And people have been around a long time, and we've been through a lot. Boy, I've seen a lot happen to the CBC in 30 plus years, but I still care deeply about it. Um, I do. One of the things, you know, you sit in. No, I, I think what Adrian was saying is very true, though, because, you know, when you're a journalist at Radio-Canada or at CBC, it's something that you're being asked constantly. So during an election period, for example, do you get, you know, instructions to say to do a type of story or not to do a type of story? And in my whole career, it never, ever happened to me, whether here in Canada or elsewhere, that uh, someone would call me, a boss, or anybody would call me to tell me, well, I think maybe you should be careful with that angle, mm -hmm. maybe we should, you know, as editorially, of course, some people would, you know, give us instructions, or uh, we, you know, we discuss issues with our ed editorial board, but uh, never has the, the political part played a role in what we do. And I think that's extremely important. The four of you are, are storytellers. And we know that, you know, as broadcasters, like uh, the privates do this, uh, public broadcasting, CBC, Radio Canada, we're trying to do that. It's to create this dialogue with, with Canadians, to have this public space, have a way of expressing the diversity of, of, of opinions, of culture, of all of that. How does that translate in, in the work that you do? Adrian? Well, I, it's funny, we were talking about this yesterday because we, we were going through this and the notion of a phrase of public space is, is, can be kind of a difficult one to understand in the same way that words like vertical integration make me shiver. I don't get it. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't live in that world and I'm rather happy that I don't have to. But it occurs to me that the reason why I was confused by the notion of public space is, is it's because it's what we do all the time. It used to be that this experience of watching television, watching television news was a very passive one. You know, there were white men who made decisions about what was important for your life and they showed it to you on television and you watched or you didn't and that was it. That's not the way it works anymore. There is a massive integration. We all talk and we all communicate. And, and so everything we do is about the, the public space. And, and lots of shows do it in lots of very specific ways. You know, the Fifth Estate, which I think stacks up against any investigative program anywhere on the planet. Uh, they did something interesting with the G20 not that long ago. They went to all the YouTube videos that everybody posted. These were the, the big riots in Toronto. And they went to the people who shot those videos and said, can we see what you shot just before that moment you posted and just after? And then they stitched all of them together. And so they got a 360 view of what really happened, never mind what the official reports were. They saw what really happened. And so this interaction with the public, this ability to work together to investigate and reveal the truth, it is what they do, what we do all the time. How do you think that this public space might be different for, for a public broadcaster for CBC versus uh, what our competitors are doing? How do you see that? I think the, uh, if I may, just I think the expectation is different um, because you own us. <laughs> You pay, you pay the bills. Uh, as Canadians, um, there is an expectation that we are completely accessible, and we're finding all kinds of interesting ways to do that. To me, the public space notion is, is metaphysical and physical. It's like the Broadcast Centre in Toronto, where I work, has a massive atrium, if you've ever been there. People come in, they eat lunch, they watch your shows on the TVs there, they see, they see Rick Mercer walking through and they say hi, and, you know, and that's, they, it's really, they're really connected to the, to the building, literally. And during the World Cup two years ago, there were outdoor parties and, and where they had massive screens set up and you could watch the games together with your friends. Like the CBC is like reaching in now. And rather as, uh, we're not passive, as, as uh, Adrian was saying. We're much more involving people now. And so that public space is there in a physical sense, but the public space is metaphysical as well. And it's, I did a show last year on Marketplace on When the Repairman Knocks, where we invited repairmen into a house with hidden cameras to see if they were legit or not. And I don't know if any of you saw that show, but while we were on the air for an hour across the country, I did a live chat online from 7 Eastern Time in Toronto, 8, uh, 8.30 here, until well <laughs> past midnight, uh, and interacting with Canadians who were watching the show who had questions or comments or ideas. So we were responding, but everybody could read that. So there were people who were learning from each other, they were learning from us, we were learning from them, they were hitting us up ahead. They were criticizing us, they were giving us kudos. It was fantastic, and we'd never done it before. So suddenly we reached into a whole new part of the country and gave them access to our show, and we got access to them that we'd never done before. That's public space, too. 
And during uh, an election in Quebec, how would that be translated? When we started uh, talking about the public uh, space, I found it a bit, it was a little bit theoretical. I had a bit of trouble. I thought about it at night, and suddenly I woke up and see the uh, public space. That's what we do. The, uh, the news bulletin is a reflection of what this uh, public space is. And uh, during the last uh, um, uh, election uh, uh, elections, we pushed it uh, to the edge. And in our news uh, bulletins, uh, there were over uh, 1,200 people expressed their views and uh, different. Uh, they, we, we, we had over 450 candidates that came to talk uh, on, on, uh, on, on online. And, uh, and uh, we have to try and, uh, and communicate with all the uh, electors and to try and reflect what they were living. And we saw what uh, they were going through. And uh, we could talk about uh, wisdom, popular wisdom. And I had an extraordinary uh, uh, experience. We had uh, the electoral uh, compass, and uh, we allow people to compare their position uh, compared to some uh, uh, questions uh, during the election and the party. So they, they're able to situate themselves on the political spectrum. And I was really amazed. And there was so much uh, uh, response, and uh, people really like that. There were over half, half a million people who went to play with this uh, electoral compass, and uh, and uh, they could uh, situate themselves. And we took their data to uh, report on what was going on and the immigration immigrants. Uh, um, uh, with the immigrants and uh, what they would, uh, the, the voices they would give to the uh, liberals, for example, how the young people reacted uh, um, uh, regarding the conflict to, uh, with the university. And uh, so it was very interactive with this, and that was an uh, uh, extraordinary tool, not just for people to express themselves, but we, the journalists, we learned a lot. So I think we pushed that uh, on uh, Twitter. Every time we uh, interviewed uh, political uh, people, we had the dialogues. That was just incredible. So now when we prepare our interviews, often we are going to post on Twitter um, we are going to 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 post uh, uh, the the who we are going to interview, not Jean Charest, but so when we interview uh, uh, politicians, we uh, want to know what they think, what they would like to hear from those uh, the question they like to ask, and it may uh, influence the way we we um, uh, we do our interviews. So it's a real very uh, a tool. Social networks. Yes. How does how does this new technology, how technology in general, but uh, social networks, how does that influence uh, the work you do? Well, we use it a lot on uh, one of the, in the last year we've launched two shows here, uh, both dedicated to that public space that we're talking about, On Point and On Point Radio. On Point is a television show on the weekends, very similar to Evan Solomon's Power and Politics, but shorter and more local. <laughs> the radio show uh, is mu much more interactive. And we have usually three politicians in the studio each week, but we reach out for feedback, less so on phone lines and more so on social media. We use Twitter for it. And what I found is really good about that is we're getting a whole new audience and a whole new demographic participating in political discussion, and that's under 35s, under 30s, under 25s, and in some cases under 20s. They're much more active on social media than on, on Twitter than they are on Facebook, which is sort of becoming the Florida of the internet. Twitter is really their <laughs> medium of choice. And they weigh into it uh, through Twitter much more than they ever would if we said, call this number, leave a voicemail, send an email. Because it's more Twitter, Pinterest, and text messages than it is even what we consider cutting edge social media things like Facebook. So we use that. And so you get a whole, one of the big issues in politics in this country is a total level of youth disengagement. They don't vote they're not listened to or they feel they're not listened to. They feel like they, they, they don't have a platform to raise their issues and speak. And I know it's only 140 characters at a time, but with the way some of them can type on their thumbs, they can hit you with six tweets in a span of 30 seconds and make a point which we can bring on the air or a question that we can put directly to a politician about an issue that matters to them. And I find that I think that's interesting because 
the, the civil, civic conversation, the public conversation in this province tends to be dominated by people of a particular generation who we've heard from for a long, long time. And if we can use our Blackberries and our iPhones to reach out to the next generation of, of, of players in this province, I think that's interesting. It, it breeds a loyalty between us and them. It brings a perspective that we haven't always been getting. And we're speaking to them on their playing field. We're not making them come to us on our terms. We're going to them on theirs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a very interesting way of engaging mm -hmm. a whole audience that, let's face it, you wouldn't think would be that interested in a political radio show every Friday afternoon. One of the things that, uh, you know, uh, Nibao was speaking a while ago about the strategic plan, uh, you know, everyone, every way. One of the, uh, the big priorities is the region, the place of the regions. How do you think, why is that important? How does it play out uh, in the work that you're doing? Well, it's, it's the entirety of the work that I'm doing, <laughs> or for the most part. I mean, the great thing about being part of the CBC is you can work in a region and get opportunities on a network level. It's one of the great reasons why you stay in a company like this. Um, I don't think you can overstate the importance of having an independent public broadcaster in the smaller population centers of the country. Um, there's, a, there's an independence there that isn't always there because of the commercial concerns of privates or the politi political pressure that can be uh, applied to private broadcasters. Um, there's the willingness, like this week, for example, we had Vicadopia, John Gotti, and Keith Burgess in Natwashish in Labrador. Uh, those are places that the public broadcaster will go, will spend. That's not a cheap set of plane tickets. That's the sort of place that we'll go, the sort of stories that we're willing to take on, and it's important that we do it. Now, the, the, the challenge we have as a national broadcaster is not to sort of ghettoize regional stories and have them only told on the regional platforms, like on Here and Now or On Point or the local radio shows. We need to find a way to get more, I think, of those regional stories up onto the network level. We do a good job of it. I think we could always do a better job of it. Maybe that's my bias as a regional reporter, but there, there's parts of this province and parts of this country that you, there's no market forces that are going to put a television broadcast or a local morning radio show the, the way we'll do it in places like Labrador. Um, it just won't be done by the private sector. So it, 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 it provides an opportunity to tell those stories to the rest of the province and to the rest of the country, and it's really only CBC that's in that game. Yeah. It's the same thing on the national level also. You were talking regionally, but... Mm -hmm. for example, no, for example, no. We to take our show on the road, so we went to various cities. We took some national issues, but translated them into a more regional yeah. way. So we mm -hmm. used local reporters. We went, for example, in Quebec or in Rimouski or Trois-Rivières, and then we took a, a national issue and we just use we, we just transformed our show into a, a regional show and and it was really interesting because and the local stations, it was extraordinary to be able to work with us. We learned, we took cameramen, and we took also a little team of our own. We had also cameramen, which were there, technicians who were there, could work with us, the reporters, the journalists who worked with us. And that gave a result which was really very interesting because it's points of view that you don't hear as often and people you don't hear speak as much. And I think that gave, gave a sort of a color which was quite different to the way which we've covered those elections. It reflected a diversity of voices and of opinions that we could have perhaps not had if we had been all the time in Montreal. And, and they reproach us also on the French side that we are, that we're too much in, um, centered in Montreal. So, so it was, it was. Saying about uh, there aren't the market forces to do it. It's mm. really interesting, you know. Uh, for me, I travel to a whole bunch of places and I'm struck by how lonely it is sometimes because you don't, <laughs> you don't bump into your colleagues from the private sector very often. You know, uh, we were in Attawapiskat a number of times uh, over the last mm. uh, year or so, and not just flying in and out, which I saw some of my colleagues do. Colleagues I had great respect for, the people themselves. Um, the, you know, we stayed, you know, because there are places you, it's important that not just to go there, but to be there, to wake up there in the morning, to watch what happens when the kids try to go to school or not go to school, you know, to, to find the key to the room that holds the donations that Canadians provided and say, hey, how come these haven't been distributed? You know, to go stand a, a, at an office and wait a, until the leadership of that community is supposed to be there and say, where were you? What's going on? You know, th this loneliness that we encounter, I think, is a, is a tribute to this organization because it's not cheap to go to these places. It's it's really and it, and it flies against I'm sure what a lot of people would think would be a good idea to get in and to get in and get out and get the story done and put your marker there. They don't they don't think like that. It's like if you're going to do the story, show up, go there, 
do the story and bring it home and go again and follow it up. You know, and it, it, is, it is a pretty lonely endeavor, and, and internationally too. I can't tell you the number of times, I know you've encountered this, we go to places where we know something is happening and it's about to happen and it's about to become something we talk about and we bump into the BBC and it's the BBC and the CBC and uh, sometimes some of the French colleagues from, from Europe and that's it. The, that's um, it. The, picking up on the idea of overseas but coming back to Canada which is massive as we all know. <laughs> it's the biggest, you know, it's a massive country and here we are as a broadcaster with, you know, 30 something million people. We are working with a budget that's a, near the bottom per capita of any public mm -hmm. broadcaster in the world in a country with six time zones, multiple languages. And we're doing, when I joined the CBC in 1981, there were 12,000 employees about that. We were doing English and French television news local. There were no news channels. There was CBC radio. There was no web, nothing else like that. Now we have multiple channels, as you know, multiple platforms with half the staff, less real dollars than we had back then, and doing more than most public broadcasters are in the world. So reflecting a country of this size and so diverse is a really difficult. It's one thing to send people overseas. It's one thing to get people mm -hmm. up north or out mm -hmm. west or down here. <clears throat> so... I think that's a, an ongoing challenge for us, to be honest, to be honest with you, and, and that's frankly is a money issue. We, you know, Iber's talked about the choices the corporations had to make in recent years. It's we've made those choices for many years. They're just getting harder and harder and harder now, and so reflecting the regions to the other regions remains, I think, this, the, the nut we haven't cracked yet. We're, it's still a work in progress, and I, I'm not talking only about news and current affairs here. I'm talking about everything. We see Republic of Doyle, which. I love, and I know you guys love, and it's, it's a fantastic success story. It kind of happened outside the CBC. We have it on the air, and it's great, and we open the place up, and we promote the heck out of it, and all the shows that are on the air. But the days of the, stu the CBC studio in St. John's rocking out you know, uh, all around the circle and everything else back in the day, those days are gone. I don't know if they'll ever be back. Um, but So we have to find new ways, more interesting ways, partnerships, that kind of thing, to reflect ourselves to each other. And, and as to echo it, what everybody else said, we're the only ones who will do it. Mm -hmm. I guess you bring me to the last question because we're running, soon running out of time but we know that we're going up for a license renewal uh, in the fall in, in November. If you had to say you know, why is it so important to have a CBC at Radio Canada? Why do we need a public broadcaster still today in 2012 even though there's all uh, a lot of choices rather than you know, 50 years ago or 75 years ago what would you say? Uh, as a Canadian I want someone to get my back you know, I, I want someone to poke people in the chest and ask them questions. And, and I, know, I know that the CBC will do it. I, I know that we will ask uncomfortable questions um, and we'll be slapped for it, and I don't care. I'm glad that I have the CBC to wake up to in the morning. You know, there isn't anywhere I, I would rather work, uh, any, anywhere. And uh, I will fight for this organization because I, I believe that we get... Canada's back and, and that we won't stop doing it. doesn't matter how much money they take away. Mm -hmm. I think it's not that we're not just your national public broadcaster, we're your local public broadcaster. We do 100 minutes of local television a day. We do news on Saturdays and Sundays on television. We do seven and a half to eight hours of live radio programming a day. And then another three to four hours of that on the weekend. No one else is going to match that. If that goes away, that's gone forever. If that gets mm -hmm. diminished, it's diminished forever. Local programming on the privates on the television side here don't increase until we increase. We announce we're going to 90 minutes, they go to 90 minutes. If we go back to 60, I guarantee you they go back to 60. That's just the way it's going to go. It's about competition and cost. But it's not just that we are the national broadcaster, we're the local public broadcaster. We're in Gander, we're in Grand Falls, we're in Cornerbrook, we're in Goose Bay, we're in Lab City. We've got stringers in places like Marystown. That counts, that matters, and Newfoundland's a small population, but man, this is a big place, as anyone knows. Trying to get a satellite truck to a story here, <laughs> how far away is that? 14 hours, you know? <laughs> These are the sort of challenges <laughs> that we deal with in a province of 500,000 people, but we're there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the truck may take a little while getting there, but the reporter will get there. And but all the it will get there. <laughs> it yeah. might get there. If it doesn't break down, yeah. <laughs> the roads are bad, there's potholes. <laughs> okay, so bit of vehicle repair, but we'll be okay. <laughs> Céline, pour toi. Moi, je pense que c'est important d'avoir une télévision publique. What's important is have a public uh, for the image that we've had, all these programs which Radio Canada does still, and which is, we are the only to do. Because if you look, for example, 
in Quebec, the television, all the different programs which have made the government react, which have uh, we've forced a, a Charbonneau commission to do something in democracy in Quebec. It's for that that we do, not only for us, but we, we're preparing the American elections. But when you look at all that Radio Canada, in spite of all the cuts, in spite of all we had lived or experienced since a certain number of years, I would say the resilience of the of these people working there, of the of the management, because all of this, who want to still allow us to do these sorts of programs, we have an pr extraordinary programming, which are some things like Discover, Discovery, Découverte, and Terre, the big documentary things, and because we are the only ones at this time to be able to still do that, so I think that's a lot of proud. We're proud of this. And I think that we've asked why recently we get up all the mornings. It's for that, so to be able to contribute to that. And I wouldn't say that honestly. It's it's not because we're in the public assembly of Radio Canada or CBC. I think I believe this. I believe this really, that we are the only people to be able to still continue to do this sort of thing, and we it is necessary that we do it. We have to do it. We can't. Um, <laughs> he loves well, that. Our veteran that. guy. He <laughs> wants to kick it off. and wants to end it. It's perfect. Uh, thank well, God we have him. Yeah, well, um, How do we plan these things, eh, yeah. There's a, an American writer named Bob Green once wrote about being a parent, and he said, you know, you can't imagine yourself having your life with a child, and you can't imagine your life without one. And um, I think CBC is like that. Why? Why do we do this? <clears throat> that just ask yourself, what would it be like without us? It wouldn't be the same. There's polling that's been done by us and other people who've said, the CBC, even if they don't watch it, needs to stay. They think it's part of who we are. They, they list it with Medicare. It, it, they put it up in that sort of stratosphere of important Canadian institutions. So Canadians are telling us that even if they watch maybe hockey, maybe that's all they watch on the CBC. Maybe they don't listen to anything. They don't know who Peter Zosky ever was. They still think the CBC needs to be here because it's a bulwark against the largest cultural leviathan in the world, the United States. We're the only country in the world that watches another country's television. Right? So somebody's got to be there for you, and that's us. And on that note, merci beaucoup au panel. Thank you for the panel. Thank you.